Hi everybody, I'm Ed from Chicago Fly House and today we want to talk about cable glides. This is a family of cable fittings that are adjustable so that we can quickly and easily make a cable of the right length. But there are some things we have to understand about these pieces in order to use them safely and to really get the best out of them. All cable glides basically work the same way. There's a housing that the cable slides through and inside that housing there's going to be a mechanism to hold on to the cable. In some cases that's a couple of rounded surfaces that when you tighten a screw grab a hold of the cable and keep it from moving. In other cases it's teeth on a spring that when you pull on the cable the teeth get tighter. There's a few different options. All of them are going to reduce the strength of the cable and that's really an important thing. If we're going to use these fittings we have to make sure that we are carefully reading what the manufacturer has to say and that we understand the differences between each fitting. Today we're going to look at two different brands of cable glides. The first one is called a Gripple, the other one called a Verloc. There are some important differences between the two brands and so we want to look at each one carefully. We'll start with the Gripple. Gripples look like this. It's a fixed housing that doesn't have any adjustable parts on the outside. The way that it works is you slide the cable through one side, you pull it out, you make a loop and slide the cable back through the other way and that allows you to make a finished loop and then presumably on the other end of the cable you have a swage connection or some other more permanent type of connection. Gripples come in a couple of different sizes uh, and they're given a number. So the small size is number one and it goes up to I believe a number six. One thing that's really important about these is that for sizes one, two and three the cable type that needs to be used with the Gripple is not a cable type that we typically use in the entertainment industry. We typically use 7x19 galvanized aircraft cable, but the cable for the smaller sized Gripples has to be either 7x7 cable or 1x19 cable. That has to do with the construction of the cable, how many bundles of how many strands each. It means that we can't just grab the cable we use all the time for the smaller sizes. The one I have here is a number four and it's the first size where we can use 7 by 19 wire rope in it and that means it's 3 16 wire rope. It's actually fairly big. If you're putting eighth inch cable into a gripple you have to make sure that the cable you're using is the right cable and not what we typically use in the entertainment industry. So the way this works is that I want to make an end loop. So I have a cable here that has a finished loop on one end already and on the other end I just have bare cable and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide the bare cable into the device and as soon as I do it's going to pull tight, it's snug, it's holding on to it now and so what I can do is pass through and I can make effectively a soft eye by passing it back through and making a loop. The good news is that if I want to adjust this loop there's a small hole and they give you this neat little pin and so what I can do is push in there and then that lets me adjust the size of my loop and it still holds tight. So uh, it makes it pretty versatile, pretty easy to adjust in either direction which is kind of nice. Uh, except you do need the tool. That's one difference between this and the Verloc that we're going to look at in a little bit. So this piece here with uh, the cable run through the gripple is ready for our testing rig and so uh, that's all there is to it. It's actually quite simple. That's what we like about these. The cable glides are fast to use. We just have to be careful. When we have the mechanical grabbers, and in the case of a gripple, it is teeth inside on a spring. When we push the tool in, what we're doing is we're releasing the uh, spring. We're pushing the spring back and letting the uh, teeth allow the cable to move. But those teeth push on that cable and they create a place where the force is concentrated and it effectively weakens the cable. And so what we find with cable glides is that their working loads are going to be less than we would expect for the size cable that we're talking about. So looking at this assembly, I see that it's good for 495 pounds of working load. That's conveniently printed right on the fitting. If we were using 3 16 cable for dead hung rigging the way we normally would, we'd probably have a five to one design factor, which would give us a working load of about 840 pounds. And here we're seeing that we're almost half that because we use the gripple. That's going to be a commonality across all cable glides that you're going to have roughly half as much load capacity because of the way the cable glide works on the cable. 
One other thing we have to understand about any cable glides, whether it's a gripple or the Verloc that we'll look at next, is that these are designed for static rigging. They are not designed for dynamic applications. And so if we're going to use these, we really have to think about, are we hanging something in a static way that's not going to see a lot of motion? Is it going to meet the load rating for the gripple? And does it need to be adjusted easily? We use these sometimes for banner rigging, lightweight things. It also can be useful for adjusting the angles of speakers if the speaker rigging that's holding up the speaker is done in a more traditional way. And then we use the cable glide just to change the angle so that if that let go, the speaker still hangs, it just wrecks the focus. This is how we generally approach working with cable glides. We wanna use them in places where the stakes are not too high, the loads are not too high, and if they were to move or let go, that there would be minimal risk involved with doing it. People ask me all the time about, are cable glides okay to use for rigging? And the answer is the same answer as with any rigging. Cable glides fit a specific purpose. They have a specific place in entertainment rigging. That place generally is going to be places where it's not mission critical, where there's either very low loads or where something's hung already and what we're using the cable glide for is to position it or hold it in place so that it doesn't move. So let's take a look at the other device we want to talk about called a Verloc from the Versales company in California. This device is going to consist of an eye nut, just a regular forged eye nut, the same as we would use for other rigging applications, and then the body of the Verloc itself. And the way that the body works is there is a screw here on the end with a knurled edge so I can finger tighten it. And then as I loosen it, I can push it in and there's springs inside that release the capture mechanism. So this is designed for eighth inch cable, not for 3 16 To thread it, what we're gonna do is loosen this nut as far as we can, almost to the point where it comes off, literally about half a thread left. And then we're going to squeeze it down like this, push the spring in. I've got a piece of eighth inch cable here that is finished on one end and loose on the other. I'm going to thread it through with the spring compressed and that will allow us to push the cable through like this with a small tail hanging out here. And then to cinch it, I'm going to just tighten this nut down. And so unlike the gripple, I have to actually tighten this. I have to, I have to loosen it and I have to tighten it. The gripple is going to be automatic. So there is a possibility here where we worry about it coming loose. This is another reason we want to use this in places where the risk is not too high. So I snug it down and then it doesn't move. But if I want to adjust it, I can loosen it back up again, almost to the point of having the nut come off and I can change. I can slide and, and shorten this way up. Once I snug it down, it won't move either direction. So once again, this is ready for our test rig. Now notice there's a tail here. We could actually just kind of pull the tail out of the, out of the way to make a connection. We want to make sure that when we're looking at the tail that we don't come too close to the edge. I don't believe there's any requirement for the length of the tail sticking out here, but we want to have a little bit of tail just to know that we got all the way through because the grabbing mechanism is in this part of the device and we want to make sure that that has cable running all the way through it. So if I can see the cable and it's coming out, that's once again ready to test. One quick thing before we go to the testing, the gripples create a soft eye which could allow us to kink this cable if we're not careful and that could skew our testing results. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a shackle with a great big pin, a large enough diameter pin that it's actually bigger than the diameter you would have if we had a thimble in there. And so that should give us good testing results. So let's take a look at how these cables bear up under testing. What I've done is I made up three assemblies of each cable and we put it on our test rig to see what would happen. Let's take a look. So we see from the testing that the results bear out what the manufacturers say. We lose not quite half of the breaking strength of the cable, but we definitely lose a significant percentage. What we saw from the gripples 
is that they all broke in kind of the same way and sort of the way we expected. If any of you have seen some of our other breaking videos, and I recommend you check them out, sometimes when we break cable, it sort of breaks all at the same place. It breaks in one specific location. What happened with these, and you can sort of see it on the tail we have here, the wire rope sort of tore open instead of shearing in a specific place. And we see the incredible recoil. Uh, all of this crazy cable looping is recoil from, again, we see here a strand of cable, but that's not the whole cable. It didn't just break in a specific spot. The reason for that is that those teeth inside the gripple push on the cable and it creates a weak spot on one strand. That causes a failure. It causes a bit of a shock, which is where we get some of the recoil that's in the cable here. And then one by one by one, the rest of the strands fail and they don't necessarily fail in the same place. That's really a telltale sign of that concentration of force in the way that those teeth work on the cable. Now, when we look at the Verlox, we see a similar look, but we see more, it looks a little bit more like what we would see with just breaking a swage connection. Although we do have an extra tail hanging out and we do have quite a bit of recoil and bounce because there's a lot of tension there. What's interesting is that when we look at the Verlock, we see that it broke inside. The cable pulls out. We can see it in the video too. The cable pulls out from the Verloc. It breaks right at the bottom of where the mechanism that holds the cable is, right at the weak spot. And it's a little different than the way the gripples work. What's fascinating is that we see how much spring there was, but if I try to bounce this, I can't move it because there's still a piece of cable in there. I actually took one of them, busted it apart, and what we see is that there's that much cable left inside. It was in this one and it, it fit about like that inside of there. You could just barely see the tail sticking out of it. So when we take that little piece out of there, we see that the Verloc actually still works the way that it's supposed to. That's another nice feature of cable fittings is that typically they're reusable. We kind of treated them badly here and so it turns out that the gripples, when you load them as much as it took to break this cable, they don't really want to let go anymore. The teeth on the side of the cable that didn't break is dug in so tight that they're basically done. The Verlocs, because we took them to their limit, they still function the way they're supposed to. It would be interesting to test several breaks like this to see if they lost any of their sort of grip strength or any of their rated capacity. This is one of those questions we don't want to leave to the interesting testing that we might do. If you have one of these pieces fail in the field the way they did in one of our tests with a, a, a full load breaking, I'm going to recommend that you take that out of service. That's just a good idea for anything that suffered a failure. We want to replace it with a new item. So reusable to a point, but of course, common sense and rigging safety are always going to take center stage. So to wrap this up, let's sum up what we've learned about cable glides. First of all, they're great if we use them for the right application. Remember that the right application is going to be a static situation where there's no dynamic loading, and it's gonna be one where the loading we expect is within what the manufacturer says about the fitting, not about the wire rope. We also have to be careful to use the right wire rope for the right fitting. Whenever we have any doubts, we go back to the manufacturer. This is something we do with all hardware. Don't take my word for it. Go check with the manufacturers of the equipment you're using. It's also worth noting there are a few other brands of cable glides that we haven't looked at here. If you're gonna use something we haven't talked about or even if you're gonna use these, make sure that you look at the information that comes along with them, read the manual, and then use these properly. They can be really convenient and they can be really helpful for the right application. We just have to use them safely. That's it for today. Leave a comment below if you have something you wanna to talk to us about or a topic you wanna to see. Like and subscribe if you like what we're doing here. And as always, thanks for watching.